I suppose praiseworthy motives are a sufficient justification almost for anything. What could be more commendable in the abstract than a girl's determination that poor Papa should not be worried, and her anxiety that the man of her choice should be kept by any means from every occasion of doing something rash, something which might endanger the whole scheme of their happiness? Nothing could be more tender and more prudent. We must also remember the girl's self-reliant temperament and the general unwillingness of women, I mean women of sense, to make a fuss over matters of that sort. As has been already said, Heemskirk turned up some time after Jasper's arrival at Nelson's Cove. The sight of the brig lying right under the bungalow was very offensive to him. He did not fly ashore before his anchor touched the ground as Jasper used to do. On the contrary, he hung about his quarter-deck, mumbling to himself, and when he ordered his boat to be manned, it was in an angry voice. Freya's existence, which lifted Jasper out of himself into a blissful elation, was for Heemskirk a cause of secret torment, of hours of exasperated brooding. While passing the brig, he hailed her harshly and asked if the master was on board. Schultz, smart and neat, in a spotless white suit, leaned over the taffrail, finding the question somewhat amusing. He looked humorously down into Heemskirk's boat and answered in the most amiable modulations of his beautiful voice, Captain Allen is up at the house, sir. But his expression changed suddenly at the savage growl, What the devil are you grinning at? which acknowledged that information. He watched Heemskirk land and, instead of going to the house, stride away by another path into the grounds. The desire-tormented Dutchman found old Nelson at his drying sheds, very busy superintending the manipulation of his tobacco crop, which, though small, was of excellent quality and enjoying himself thoroughly. But Heemskirk soon put a stop to this simple happiness. He sat down by the old chap, and by the sort of talk which he knew was best calculated for the purpose, reduced him before long to a state of concealed and perspiring nervousness. It was a horrid talk of authorities, and old Nelson tried to defend himself. If he dealt with English traders, it was because he had to dispose of his produce somehow. He was as conciliatory as he knew how to be, and this very thing seemed to excite Heemskirk, who had worked himself up into a heavily breathing state of passion. And the worst of them all is that Alan, he growled, your particular friend, eh? You have let in a lot of these Englishmen into this part. You ought never to have been allowed to settle here, never. What's he doing here now? Old Nelson, becoming very agitated, declared that Jasper Allen was no particular friend of his. No friend at all, at all. He had bought three tons of rice from him to feed his work people on. What sort of evidence of friendship was that? Heemskirk burst out at last with the thought that had been gnawing at his vitals. Yes, sell three tons of rice and flirt three days with that girl of yours. I am speaking to you as a friend, Nielsen. This won't do. You are only on sufferance here. Old Nelson was taken aback at first, but recovered pretty quickly. Won't do, certainly. Of course it wouldn't do. The last man in the world. But his girl didn't care for the fellow, 
and was too sensible to fall in love with anyone. He was very earnest in impressing on Heemskirk his own feeling of absolute security, and the lieutenant, casting doubting glances sideways, was yet willing to believe him. Much you know about it, he grunted nevertheless. But I do know, insisted old Nelson, with the greater desperation because he wanted to resist the doubts arising in his own mind. My own daughter, in my own house, and I not to know? Come, it would be a good joke, Lieutenant. They seem to be carrying on considerably, remarked Heemskirk moodily. I suppose they are together now, he added, feeling a pang which changed what he meant for a mocking smile into a strange grimace. The harassed Nelson shook his hand at him. He was at the bottom shocked at this insistence, and was even beginning to feel annoyed at the absurdity of it. Pooh pooh, I'll tell you what, Lieutenant, you go to the house and have a drop of gin and bitters before dinner. Ask for Freya. I must see the last of this tobacco put away for the night, but I'll be along presently. Heemskirk was not insensible to this suggestion. It answered to his secret longing, which was not a longing for drink, however. Old Nelson shouted solicitously after his broad back a recommendation to make himself comfortable and that there was a box of cheroots on the veranda. It was the west veranda that old Nelson meant, the one which was the living room of the house, and had split rattan screens of the very finest quality. The east veranda, sacred to his own privacy, puffing out his cheeks and other signs of perplexed thinking, was fitted with stout blinds of sailcloth. The north veranda was not a veranda at all, really. It was more like a long balcony. It did not communicate with the other two, and could only be approached by a passage inside the house. It had a privacy which made it a convenient place for a maiden's meditation without words, and also for the discourses, apparently, without sense, which, passing between a young man and a maid, become pregnant with a diversity of transcendental meanings. This north veranda was embowered with climbing plants. Freya, whose room opened out on it, had furnished it as a sort of boudoir for herself, with a few cane chairs and a sofa of the same kind. On this sofa she and Jasper sat, as close together as is possible in this imperfect world where neither can a body be in two places at once, nor yet two bodies can be in one place at the same time. They had been sitting together all the afternoon, and I won't say that their talk had been without sense. Loving him with a little judicious anxiety, Lest, in his elation, he should break his heart over some mishap, Freya naturally would talk to him soberly. He, nervous and brusque, when away from her, appeared always as if overcome by her visibility, by the great wonder of being palpably loved. An old man's child, having lost his mother early, thrown out to sea, out of the way, while very young, he had not much experience of tenderness of any kind. In this private, foliage-embowered veranda, and at this late hour of the afternoon, he bent down a little, and possessing himself of Freya's hands, was kissing them, one after another, while she smiled and looked down at his head, with the eyes of approving compassion. At the same moment, Heemskirk was approaching the house from the north. Antonia was on the watch on that side, but she did not keep a very good watch. The sun was setting, 
she knew that her young mistress and the captain of the Benito were about to separate. She was walking to and fro in the dusky grove with a flower in her hair and singing softly to herself, when suddenly, within a foot of her, the lieutenant appeared from behind a tree. She bounded aside like a startled fawn, but Heemskirk, with a lucid comprehension of what she was there for, pounced upon her, and catching her arm, clasped his other thick hand over her mouth. If you try to make a noise, I'll twist your neck. This ferocious figure of speech terrified the girl sufficiently. Heemskirk had seen plainly enough on the veranda Freya's golden head with another head very close to it. He dragged the unresisting maid with him by a circuitous way into the compound, where he dismissed her with a vicious push in the direction of the cluster of bamboo huts for the servants. She was very much like the faithful camerista of Italian comedy, but in her terror she bolted away without a sound from that thick, short, black-eyed man with a cruel grip of fingers like a vice, quaking all over at a distance, extremely scared and half inclined to laugh. She saw him enter the house at the back. The interior of the bungalow was divided by two passages crossing each other in the middle. At that point, Heemskirk, by turning his head slightly to the left, as he passed, secured the evidence of carrying on, so irreconcilable with old Nelson's assurances that it made him stagger with the rush of blood to his head. Two white figures, distinct against the light, stood in an unmistakable attitude. Freya's arms were round Jasper's neck. Their faces were characteristically superimposed on each other, and Heemskirk went on, his throat choked with a sudden rising of curses, till on the west veranda he stumbled blindly against a chair, and then dropped into another, as though his legs had been swept from under him. He had indulged too long in the habit of appropriating Freya to himself and his thoughts, is that how you entertain your visitors, you, he thought, so outraged that he could not find a sufficiently degrading epithet. Freya struggled a little and threw her head back. Somebody has come in, she whispered. Jasper, holding her clasped closely to his breast, looked down into her face, suggested casually, your father. Freya tried to disengage herself, but she had not the heart absolutely to push him away with her hands. I believe it's Heemskirk, she breathed out at him. He, plunging into her eyes in a quiet rapture, was provoked to a vague smile by the sound of the name. The ass is always knocking down my beacons outside the river, he murmured. He attached no other meaning to Heemskirk's existence, but Freya was asking herself whether the lieutenant had seen them. Let me go, kid, she ordered in a peremptory whisper. Jasper obeyed, and stepping back at once, continued his contemplation of her face under another angle. I must go and see, she said to herself anxiously. She instructed him hurriedly to wait a moment after she was gone, and then to slip on to the back veranda and get a quiet smoke before he showed himself. Don't stay late this evening, was her last recommendation before she left him. Then Freya came out on the west veranda with her light, rapid step. While going through the doorway, she managed to shake down the folds of the looped-up curtains at the end of the passage, so as to cover Jasper's retreat from the bower. Directly she appeared, Heemskirk jumped as if to fly at her. She paused, 
and he made her an exaggerated low bow. It irritated Freya. Oh, it's you, Mr. Hemskirk. How do you do? She spoke in her usual tone. Her face was not plainly visible to him in the dusk of the deep veranda. He dared not trust himself to speak. His rage at what he had seen was so great, and when she added with serenity, Papa will be coming in before long, he called her horrid name silently to himself before he spoke with contorted lips. I have seen your father already. We had a talk in the sheds. He told me some very interesting things. Oh, very. Freya sat down. She thought he has seen us, for certain. She was not ashamed. What she was afraid of was some foolish or awkward complication. But she could not conceive how much her person had been appropriated by Heemskirk in his thoughts. She tried to be conversational. You are coming now from Palembang, I suppose. Eh, what? Oh, yes, I come from Palembang. Ha, ha, ha. You know what your father said. He said he was afraid you were having a very dull time of it here. And I suppose you're going to cruise in the Malacca's, continued Freya who wanted to impart some useful information to Jasper, if possible. At the same time, she was always glad to know that those two men were a few hundred miles apart when not under her eye. Heemskirk growled angrily. Yes, Malacus, glaring in the direction of her shadowy figure. Your father thinks it's very quiet for you here. I tell you what, Miss Freya, there isn't such a quiet spot on earth that a woman can't find an opportunity of making a fool of somebody. Freya thought, I mustn't let him provoke me. Presently, the Tamil boy, who was Nelson's head servant, came in with the lights. She addressed him at once, with voluble directions where to put the lamps, told him to bring the tray with the gin and bitters, and to send Antonia into the house. I will have to leave you to yourself, Mr. Heemskirk, for a while, she said. And she went to her room to put on another frock. She made a quick change of it, because she wished to be on the veranda before her father and the lieutenant met again. She relied on herself to regulate that evening's intercourse between these two. But Antonia, still scared and hysterical, exhibited a bruise on her arm, which roused Freya's indignation. He jumped on me, out of the bush like a tiger, said the girl, laughing nervously with frightened eyes. The brute, thought Freya. He meant to spy on us then. She was enraged, but the recollection of the thick Dutchman in white trousers wide at the hips and narrow at the anchors, with his shoulder straps and black bullet head glaring at her, and the light of the lamps was so repulsively comical that she could not help a smiling grimace. Then she became anxious. The absurdities of three men were forcing this anxiety upon her. Jasper's impetuosity, her father's fears, Heemskirk's infatuation, she was very tender to the first two, and she made up her mind to display all her feminine diplomacy. All this, she said to herself, will be over and done with before very long now. Heemskirk, on the veranda, lolling on a chair, his legs extended and his white cap reposing on his stomach, was lashing himself into a fury of an atrocious character altogether incomprehensible to a girl like Freya. His chin was resting on his chest. His eyes gazed stonily at his shoes. Freya examined him from behind the curtain. He didn't stir. He was ridiculous. But this absolute stillness was impressive. She stole back along the passage to the east veranda, where Jasper was sitting quietly in the dark, doing what he was told, like a good boy. Psst, 
she hissed. He was by her side in a moment. Yes, what is it? he murmured. It's that beetle, she whispered uneasily. Under the impression of Heemskirk's sinister immobility, she had half a mind to let Jasper know that they had been seen. But she was by no means certain that Heemskirk would tell her father, and at any rate, not that evening. She concluded rapidly that the safest thing would be to get Jasper out of the way as soon as possible. "'What has he been doing?' asked Jasper in a calm undertone. "'Oh, nothing, nothing. He sits there looking cross. But you know how he's always worrying, Papa.' "'Your father is quite unreasonable,' pronounced Jasper, judicially. "'I don't know,' she said in a doubtful tone. Something of old Nelson's dread of the authorities had rubbed off on the girl, since she had to live with it day after day. "'I don't know. Papa's afraid of being reduced to beggary, as he says in his old days. Look here, kid. You had better clear out tomorrow, first thing.' Jasper had hoped for another afternoon with Freya, an afternoon of quiet felicity with a girl by his side and his eyes on his brig, anticipating a blissful future. His silence was eloquent with disappointment, and Freya understood it very well. She too was disappointed, but it was her business to be sensible. We shan't have a moment to ourselves with that beetle creeping round the house, she argued in a low, hurried voice. So what's the good of your staying? And he won't go while the brig is here. You know he won't. He ought to be reported for loitering, murmured Jasper with a vexed little laugh. Mind you, get underway at daylight, recommended Freya under her breath. He detained her after the manner of lovers. She expostulated without struggling because it was hard for her to repulse him. He whispered into her ear while he put his arms around her. Next time we two meet, next time I hold you like this, it shall be on board, you and I, in the brig, all the world, all the life. And then he flashed out, I wonder... I can wait. I feel as if I must carry you off now, at once. I could run with you in my hands, down the path, without stumbling, without touching the earth. She was still. She listened to the passion in his voice. She was saying to herself that if she were to whisper the faintest yes, if she were but to sigh lightly her consent, he would do it. He was capable of doing it without touching the earth. She closed her eyes and smiled in the dark, abandoning herself in a delightful giddiness, for instance, to his encircling arm. But before he could be tempted to tighten his grasp, she was out of it, a foot away from him and in full possession of herself. That was the steady Freya. She was touched by the deep sigh which floated up to her from the white figure of Jasper, who did not stir. You are a mad kid, she said tremulously. Then, without a change of tone, no one could carry me off, not even you. I am not the sort of girl that kids carried off. His white form seemed to shrink a little before the force of that assertion, and she relented. Isn't it enough for you to know that you have that you have carried me away, she added in a tender tone. He murmured an endearing word, and she continued, I've promised you, I've said I would come, and I shall come of my own free will. You shall wait for me on board. I shall get up the side by myself and walk up to you on the deck and say, Here I am, kid, and then, and then I shall be carried off. But it will be no man who will carry me off. It will be the brig, your brig, our brig. I love the beauty. She heard an inarticulate sound, something like a moan, wrung out by pain or delight, and glided away. 
There was that other man on the other veranda, that dark, surly Dutchman who could make trouble between Jasper and her father, bring about a quarrel, ugly words, and perhaps a physical collision. What a horrible situation! But even putting aside that awful extremity, she shrank from having to live for some three months with a wretched, tormented, angry, distracted, absurd man. And when the day came, the day and the hour, what should she do if her father tried to detain her by main force, as was, after all, possible? Could she actually struggle with him hand to hand? But it was of lamentations and entreaties that she was really afraid. Could she withstand them? What an odious, cruel, ridiculous position would that be? But it won't be. He'll say nothing, she thought, as she came out quickly on the west veranda, and seeing that Heemskirk did not move, sat down on a chair near the doorway and kept her eyes on him. The outraged lieutenant had changed his attitude. Only his cap had fallen off his stomach and was lying on the floor. His thick black eyebrows were knitted by a frown while he looked at her out of the corners of his eyes. And their sideways glance, in conjunction with the hooked nose, the whole bulky, ungainly, sprawling person struck Freya as so comically moody that inwardly, discomposed as she was, she could not help smiling. She did her best to give that smile a conciliatory character. She did not want to provoke Heemskirk needlessly. And the lieutenant, perceiving that smile, was mollified. It never entered his head that his outward appearance, as a naval officer in uniform, could appear ridiculous to that girl of no position, the daughter of old Nielsen. The recollection of her arms round Jasper's neck still irritated and excited him. The hussy, he thought, smiling, eh? That's how you are amusing yourself, fooling your father finally, aren't you? You have a taste for that sort of fun, have you? Well, we shall see. He did not alter his position, but on his pursed-up lips there also appeared a smile of surly and ill-omened amusement, while his eyes returned to the contemplation of his boots. Freya felt hot with indignation. She sat radiantly fair in the lamplight, her strong, well-shaped hands lying one on top of the other in her lap. Odious creature, she thought, her face colored with sudden anger. You have scared my maid out of her senses, she said aloud. What possessed you? He was thinking so deeply of her that the sound of her voice pronouncing these unexpected words it startled him extremely. He jerked his head up and looked so bewildered that Freya insisted impatiently. I mean Antonia. You have bruised her arm. What did you do it for? Do you want to quarrel with me? He asked thickly with a sort of amazement. He blinked like an owl. He was funny. Freya, like all women, had a keen sense of the ridiculous in outward appearance. Well, no, I don't think I do. She could not help herself. She laughed outright, a clear, nervous laugh, in which Heemskirk joined suddenly with a harsh ha-ha-ha-ha. Voices and footsteps were heard in the passage, and Jasper, with old Nelson, came out. Old Nelson looked at his daughter approvingly, for he liked the lieutenant to be kept in good humor, and he also joined sympathetically in the laugh. Now, lieutenant, we shall have some dinner, he said, rubbing his hands cheerily. Jasper had gone straight to the balustrade. The sky was full of stars, and in the blue velvety night the cove below had a denser blackness in which the riding lights of the brig of the gunboat glimmered redly like suspended sparks. Next time this riding light, 
glimmers down there, I'll be waiting for her on the quarter deck to come and say, Here I am, Jasper thought, and his heart seemed to grow bigger in his chest, dilated by an oppressive happiness that nearly wrung out a cry from him. There was no wind, not a leaf below him stirred, and even the sea was but a still, uncomplaining shadow. Far away on the unclouded sky, the pale lightning, the heat lightning of the tropics, played tremulously amongst the low stars in short, faint, mysteriously consecutive flashes, like incomprehensible signals from some distant planet.